My favorite cinema is very visually driven. It's not like a play. It's like a dream. It's just a pure emotion. This film's a melting pot of movies I grew up loving. Go, go, go! A Vietnam movie mixed with robotic sci-fi. They've come for the child. Gareth has this ability to inject compassion in a sci-fi genre that usually leans on spectacle and danger. Fire! Gareth Edwards, he is a visionary. And these characters are all relatable and you fall in love with them. I thought, oh my God, sign me up. I want to be a part of this. What jumped out was the magical realism that he was able to execute. The depth and emotion that he was able to capture in every frame. They're my family. They're not people, Maya. They're not real. You and I are real. This is real. Okay, and cut, good. The film deals with a lot of big themes like what does it mean to be human? And what does it mean to be alive? And can love transcend those divides and boundaries? You're my friend? Should we embrace it? Should we destroy it? Everyone ready? Three. And action. Gareth shoots in a way that a lot of actors love because he doesn't like to cut. Keep going, keep going. I love that process where we do these rounds of just takes. He operates the camera himself. You know, he knows what he wants. Gareth, he's not afraid to try anything. And anything goes. We really went for broke. It's just a really insane, rich visual journey that I hope affects people in the way that I was affected when cinema blew my mind as a kid. Locate the weapon. Yeah. Describe it. It's a kid. John David's character, he's supposed to destroy this weapon, but it happens to be in the form of a six-year-old child. Hey, hey, little bot, pay attention. My name is not Bot. My name is Alfie. Remember? Usually, robots in movies are all cold, but with Alfie, we keep the humanity in. It forces John David's character to start questioning everything he thought about AI. Are you going to heaven? No. You gotta be a good person to go to heaven. It's hard to make a decision, empathy or self-preservation. What do you want, sweetie? For robots to be free. We don't have that in the fridge. How about ice cream? It was so good for the movie that Madeline and JD bonded. Maddie forces me to be honest. Where's my wife? Tell me where that's going. Where is my wife? <laughs> they were inseparable. The bug. <laughs> She's extremely talented and fearless. They're coming to get me. Trust me, I'm getting you out of this. Maddie is a special human being. To be able to emote the way she does, to be able to bring such life into this character, it was amazing. Action. I have to help. There's nothing we can do. I have to help. Alfred, we gotta go. They convey so much. It just looks, just feels really unique. You know what you have to do. I can't do that. It's like you want, hmm? You have to help her. Action! As we were making the creator, AI has gotten better and better. And it feels like we're at that tipping point now. And this movie questions, what does that look like 50 years from now when AI is more embedded as part of society? This is a fight for our very existence. Let's move, move, move. Did you locate the weapon? Yeah, it's here. It's a kid. I think Gareth's really clever in how he built this world. Everything feels very organic and very grounded. The way we wanted to approach AI in this film was as naturalistic as possible. Whether it be the simulants or our robots, we found a really lovely balance being able to show the tech, but also show that they think for themselves, they have feelings. I do one with the child. It was massively ambitious but Gareth's a director with an absolute vision. This film will challenge what you believe. It's hard to know whose side to be on. They've come for me. Alfie! I don't think anyone's ever seen anything like this. Seatbelt. It deals with what does it mean to be human? 
What does it mean to be alive? And can love kind of transcend those divides? Those ideas are at the heart of this film, and it's not an easy thing to answer. Command confirmed. It's been a pleasure to serve you. Launch! What's so unique about it is instead of filming everything in a studio with green screen, we are shooting in these beautiful countries. Action! We shot in Cambodia, Indonesia, Nepal, Japan, and Thailand. We got to capture these stunning locations and then sort of like push them into the future. The child, she's our only hope to end this war. It's a really cool world. Visually, I think it's extraordinary. We really did these massive spectacle set pieces around the world. That lend themselves to, like, the biggest screen possible. They've come for me. Alfred! What is the purpose of your travel? To be free. When we were working on this film, we talked a little bit about music, and I said my number one choice would be Hans Zimmer. I sent him this little taste of the movie, and he absolutely loved it, and he was like, OK, I'm in, let's do it. Working with Hans and Steve Mazzaro was a very moving experience. You go, here we go, we're going to see some little genius moment happen. He'll just play different combinations, and maybe it goes, no, maybe back, maybe, maybe this, and little things will happen, and you'll see him go into this little zone, doing something incredible. Joshua. Take care of her. One of my favorite pieces of music in the film, there's this conversation between Joshua and Alfie, and musically, it has to all be doing complementary and contrasting things. Are you going to heaven? No. You gotta be a good person to go to heaven. So, we're just saying, we can't go to heaven because you're not good. And I'm not a person. The most important thing to me, also to Hans, is emotion. Music encourages you, pulls you in a certain direction emotionally. What Hans is doing in the film just goes straight into the soul. What do you want, sweetie? To be free. I really didn't want to do this movie in a studio against green screen, so we we managed to talk the studio into letting us go to, you know, into the real world to shoot real locations. We went to eight different countries. We went to Nepal, Cambodia, Tokyo, um, Indonesia, um, Vietnam, Thailand, and and shot in all these like the basically the best locations in the world. We found that if you could make the crew small enough then the cost of flying anywhere in the world becomes cheaper than building a set, you know, against green screen or something. So suddenly we were allowed to go wherever we wanted. And it was kind of amazing. It, the, the biggest problem was it with all the traveling, we traveled 10,000 miles. Um, it was kind of exhausting as well. And, and it was six months of filming and, and it was just like far too long to make a movie with. But every time we stood somewhere and we were on like this the beaches of Thailand or some paddy fields like in Indonesia, you get so excited about what you're seeing and how beautiful it looks, like all that exhaustion just goes away. And we also were doing it, you know, as we started planning the movie, the pandemic came along and it was like, oh no, here we go. We're not gonna be able to make this film now. And, and like everybody in the world, you know, this terrible thing happened and a year and a half went by but then we were the first people into these countries after the the rules changed and we could go and go and go over there and film. And the great thing about that is there was no tourists. So we ended up in all these amazing locations. We were kind of the first ones in. So life was carrying on. People were really happy to see, you know, you know, Westerners again and tourists, you know, but um, people, you know, stopped wearing masks and and we're like happy to be out and kids playing in the street and so we were, we found, we thought it was really like, it was very important to me that, that as a Hollywood film, we didn't come into these um, villages and environments and like block off the street and push all these people out. Like the best thing about these locations are all the faces 
and all the crazy randomness, like the little, you know, um, farm animals and livestock that just run across the street in the middle of a, a shot and things like this. And so, so we we got very small and the crew hid out the way and it allowed us to film with all these amazing actors in these real locations, but um, kind of keep life, keep the village life and the real world flowing through. And then we added like with Industrial Light and Magic, we managed to add all the science fiction on top. And I think the result is, you know, you get a much more rich, believable, like random world that you don't really see in big epic sci-fi Hollywood films. I, I don't like films that preach at the audience. I think everyone who watches a movie where you're being force fed, you know, some sort of message too much, you, you kind of reject it. And so when you write a movie, if you sit down and go, okay, I'm gonna make a film about prejudice, you're gonna make a terrible movie. And so what you do is you find something that interests you. And I, the thing I found really interesting is um, this idea that you can save humanity. All you have to do, like AI is taking over the world. All you have to do to save humanity is kill this top breakthrough AI, this super AI that is gonna, the first thing and only thing that can surpass humankind. The problem is it's in the form of a six-year-old child. And I really like that dilemma of, could you kill a kid to save the world? And that, that was the original premise. And as you start writing it, you know, about halfway through making a film, you start to realize what the movie's really about, like what the hidden meaning is. And science fiction is always a metaphor for, you know, probably one of the best genres to have as as because everything's really a metaphor for something else. And in our movie, AI and robots were kind of representing people who are different to you, um, like the other people that you, we often see as the enemy. And the idea of like, how would you feel if you were AI? And in a way, you probably feel like a slave to humans and that, that we were the bad guys. And so I wanted to create a story that kind of threw a hero into that world and made them question all their preconceptions. And, and I think that's what science fiction is best at. It usually takes something, you know, that's in, from the real world and just twists it upside down. And then suddenly everything you thought you believed you start to not be so sure of and I think the best kind of science fiction that's got like meat on the bone like that um, is you know as much as it's fun to watch spaceships and explosions and robots if there's not some sort of meaning some deeper meaning at the heart of it then it's all kind of pointless and and I know the films I've carried through the years that I grew up loving um, had this kind of significant you know, message at the heart of them that um, that you kind of keep in your pocket even when you're an adult. I feel like, you know, the ultimate goal of any filmmaker is, you know, let's be honest, it's like if you can make people tear up or cry when they watch a movie, like there's no bigger accolade than that. And I remember as a kid, you know, going to see E.T., excited about seeing an alien maybe in a spaceship or something and got sucked into this relationship um, that made me like bore my eyes out. And I still, you know, it still makes me cry now as an adult watching it. And so like, that was the high benchmark of like trying, want to, want to do something science fiction and robots and all this, but the ultimate goal is to take the audience on this journey where they might come in with preconceptions about, you know, the kind of film they're going to see and what, what they think of AI and, you know, all that technology, but they get, they get sucked in and there's this problem, there's this kid you know, you can you can win the war, you can save the world, just kill this kid, that's all you gotta do. But the kid seems quite real. I kinda like the kid. You kind of like really struggle, like our central character just struggles with this relationship and how to, you know, and you kind of, you wanna take the audience on that journey too, where they, they don't know what to do either. And I think the biggest reaction we've had from the film that people weren't expecting is, I took, I took the movie up to all the visual effects artists that were working on the film. I showed them like a rough cut of the movie and then the lights went up and everyone looked around. They're all 40 year old men like me and they turned around and they all had bloodshot eyes and they were like, well, I wasn't expecting that. And that was like probably the highest compliment I could have got is that we managed to make grown men cry 
Um, and so, yeah, so it was, it was kind of like, you know, it was always part of the plan if we could pull it off. Action. 